y'all can two step alongs out there. practice low stress management so that the cattle are never abused or driven or anything. They're, they're always uh, very, very easy going and, uh, and very, very tame. Oh, Trina, she's fed my cows for the last uh, seven or eight years. Yeah, oh, all the time I was mayor. I mean, I didn't have any time to come out here and work and of course I had no equipment out here. But she still does this for me, which is a great, uh, great help to me. It saves me having to have the equipment and, uh, and so on. I now have the time, but I don't have the equipment. I still think that the most enduring accomplishment that I was responsible for leading uh, would be the founding of the Community Foundation. The second would be serving as mayor from 2004 to 2013, the nine years. And during that time, we had to weather a severe economic downturn in 2008. We managed to recover our facilities deficit that had been allowed to occur in the previous administration. I was very happy to leave the city in a very solid financial position and felt that the people I worked with, both on staff and on the three councils, that we'd accomplished some really good things. Growth was the key piece in the time that I was mayor because the city grew from about 60,000 to nearly 100,000. And that was 5% average growth rate, which is huge for any community. It required discipline and, uh, and it required vision. And we had, we had that. So the influence that I tried to instill as mayor was along the lines of uh, practicality, strong fiscal management, a sense of social responsibilities. And from my own background, I have an appreciation of heritage, culture, and art. Now, in, in the position that I'm in where I'm no longer in a leadership position, and I'm actually no longer in a very active position in the community, I guess it just bothers me to see things go backwards or to be abandoned. But I, I have to be philosophical about it and say, well, if the people don't want that, then I can't make them want it. It's like your children. You want your son to be a farmer or you want your son to be a doctor. Well, if your son doesn't want to be a doctor, it really isn't going to work. And I would think that um, Red Deer and District Community Foundation being first, and the mayorship. The third thing would be founding of the Heritage Community Foundation, which was a far-reaching look at Alberta's history. Now there's a whole lot of other other things that I've done that are, that are pretty exciting, but those would be the top three. The, the price isn't as good as it was in August, but um, last year the, the prices were, uh, for the bulls were 1,500 and the, the heifers were 1300 I think that this year they'll likely be up closer to 2000 We, we become urbanites. We, uh, we entertain ourselves in the urban setting. We shop in the urban setting. We go to school in the urban setting. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying it's very different from what it used to be. 
they, some some people find it difficult to believe that there's a department of agriculture in the provincial government. Why a department of agriculture? Why do we need a department of agriculture? We never see any of it. Well, of course you don't see it. You're not out there. Just put one sort of at the back of the hay shed and one closer up here. We have the lowest number of cattle in Alberta since the 1950s. We have never had such a small herd and that's that's due to a lot of things. One, not the least of which, was when a number of people took a beating during the BSE crisis. We're recovering from that, but you don't recover in the beef industry as rapidly as you do if you're raising pigs. You can be out of pigs and into pigs in a year and a half. Well, you're just nicely climbing into cattle <laughs> in a year and in two or three or four years. Yeah, you may build up a herd. Oh no, we don't want you down here. You go back the other way. Climate change to the rural people, they have dealt with a range of climate and weather issues from the, the wet years of the 1890s, the vicious winter of 1906 that killed off half the livestock in the whole area, uh, to the Dust Bowl depression where they had to move away from the communities in the Palliser Triangle. And I think it's harder for them to see that there is evidence of climate change because they've seen everything that's happening has happened before. What is really changing people's view is the intensity of the weather that we're receiving. You see, Calgary's been there for 135 years, and they've never had anything like the flood that they had before, which was the perfect storm. Heavy rain in the mountains in a very short period of time during the season of snowmelt, and it just washed Calgary out. So it's easier for the urbans to see the effect, and they're not used to weather adversity. They don't like that. You know, like clean this street, get rid of this snow. You know, what do you mean the sewer's plugged? I don't want to drive around this. You know, I mean, farmers. The water bowl freezes up, you use the other one, you know. I mean, it's, you can't get your knickers in a twist over, over minor issues. Thanks, Trina. Well, uh, give me a yell on Thursday if it's a nice day and you're free, we'll, we'll do the cattle. When the old way starts to squeeze, you eventually say, you know, maybe we should. But right now, I mean, we're awash in oil and gas. We're awash in coal. We shouldn't be burning coal to generate electricity. We know that. But it's going to take a kick in the pants to wean us off the coal. Because what are we going to do with the coal? We're going to sell it to China. So what's the difference? So the, the rural people, for example, have been way ahead in, in power alternatives. When I was a kid, every farm had a windmill. They pumped water with the windmill. They ran their Delco power for their lights and their radio and their toaster in the house on a little whirly gig thing. Then we got very sophisticated. We have gas, we have electricity, we have coal. We don't have to use those things anymore. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? It's all back. We now have windmills that make our little windmills look sick. I mean, they've got 90-foot veins on them and, and they generate enough power to light half the city of Red Deer. <laughs> However, it's wind power and solar power has to be the way of the future. Oh, not without its critics. The people who say, oh, they blight the landscape. They were, they were included in every painting and photograph of an early farmstead. Now I can see the clouds on the horizon. Bad times are coming around again. The sun is ripens corn across the country. And shares are rising on. Yeah, it's not glamorous. I can look much, much better without it. You know, and if you wear them when you ski and you wear them when you bike, why wouldn't you wear them when you ride a horse? Well, 
What they need is a dose of reality. They live and work in a volatile industry. And it has its ups and downs. And right now it's down. And yes, it will come back up. My warning to them is $107 a barrel oil is never going to happen again. I'd be happy to be proven wrong. But I don't think it's going there. I think we're going to $55 a barrel oil, and everybody will make lots of money at $55 a barrel. People were told by Pallison that there's an area of Alberta that borders on Saskatchewan. It's a big triangle. I worked in it during my summers when I was a kid down in Sesford and Pollockville and south of Hannah and so on. Palliser said, this is too dry. It, the land should never be broken and it will never be viable as farmland. People started flooding in and they said, oh, this is wonderful land here on the Red Deer River and blah, 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 blah. They were in, they were in a real rainy, high cycle of moisture, Okay. So they built their ranches and ta-da-da-da-da. Well, then it got drier and drier and drier and drier. Rentable. And the other way we've done it is uh, I buy one, bring them in, and then sell them again. Because I don't keep one all year round. My experience was going, and this was somewhat eerie as a young kid, we'd be doing the survey of these PFRA farm areas, and we'd come across houses that people had abandoned, and they'd reached a point where they could no longer carry on, so they just packed up and left, and the dishes were still on the table. They must have said, honey, I can't take it anymore. We're out of here. Hitch up the wagon, and we're gone. And so we're, we're withdrawing from the, from the special areas. Rural Alberta says the same thing. I mean, when I lived in Mirror, there were 850 people lived there. Now there are 320 people live in Mirror. The only reason there are more people living in Alex now is because there's a malting plant there and the Joffrey plant is there. And that's a nice commute. But you look at places like Castor and Coronation and way out there, what is there for people to work at out there unless you're in the oil and gas industry? And you drive a truck from lease to lease, you know, to do to do your thing. Or you have a ranch at Castor and you work at Fort McMurray for three weeks and then come home for two weeks and go up to Fort McMurray. I mean, we we've changed we've changed the works. We we've we've made some adaptations and we will have to continue to make them. And it isn't right or wrong and it isn't political. It isn't anything. It's it's just the way life evolves. The first year I had these heifers after I was retired as mayor they were bred to calve april the first and the first one came march the 28th and it was snowing and miserable and awful cold wind blowing and he was out of the wind he was in the shelter of the feeder but he was lying down in muck and water and i thought you're not going to make it because he just looked terrible so i picked him up and put him in the sled and showed his mother where I was taking him and she followed me over and I took him and put him in the bunkhouse and left him there for about an hour on a tarp. Came back in a little while and he was sitting up looking around and brought him back out and away he went. We ended up with an NDP government less out of a positive move and more out of a reaction to a negative situation. What do you think, Bo? You were either going to go extreme right or middle right, and that split the right, and that was enough to allow, with some feeling of mistrust and anger toward the right generally, that they were going to go with the NDP. So I'm not sure it's that people flock to the NDP because they love the NDP. I think they flocked to the NDP because it was an alternative to extreme conservatism or conservatism that they felt had got tarnished. I have to do the horse feed today, so I'm going to come out later on and I'll do some circles in the arena with Bo. I think we're likely in for two terms. You know, unless the NDP really makes some errors, 
again, going back to what's an error. A difference of opinion isn't necessarily an error. I guess that's what I tried to say earlier. If the NDP put the province in financial turmoil, they'll be gone. Mm -hmm. And that's a fear that some people have. If the NDP restore some social justice, by social justice I mean attack the social deficit. And if they attack the physical deficit of roads, bridges, and sewer systems, which were all built in the 60s, which are all going to collapse at the same time, they will be applauded for that. And it's not their fault. It's just that they have to clean it up. You know what I mean? Thank you, Bo. The political divide is an artificial divide. Always remember that. And some people will heave, hove to a political party when really they know better. If you said to them, Ruben, do you really believe this stuff? Well, no, but I've been on to the party for so long, I've got to go along with it. There's, there's a lot of that goes on. And, uh, and the other thing is, I think there are a number of voters this time around who never voted ever in their life before. Now, are they going to stay engaged? Or do we lose them? Western gals with those hearts praying you don't become brave. Too high, lonesome viper.